those are the people who've really done it for me. Gotcha. And now uh, you mentioned the arts as a, uh, I know that you've also done some work that your day job isn't as an artist. So how do you balance the two? Because you are both an artist as well as you have a day job as well. So I was wondering how you balance the two. Well, <laughs> I'm trying to do a better job of balancing at the moment, but um, I do work in the printing industry. Um, I would love to be working full time as an artist, and that's that's what my uh, my goal is now. Um, but during the day, I actually carry a, a sketch pad, you know, and pens and and pencils with me, so that when ideas hit, you know, I don't lose them. And I come home and I jump jump right into my my studio space, you know. Um, so, but. Mm-hmm. Is that one of the things that you did at your house is you created a space? Because I know even when I talk to friends of mine, they have to have their space for their creative aspect that's away from the family space. So it sounds like to me that within your house, and I assume it's a house, you created some sort of space that is uh, only for your artwork and your studio time. Oh, absolutely. And I actually am single, live alone, so I don't have to worry about (laughs) separating what I'm doing, you know, um, in any particular way. But I do have a separate room, and it is completely dedicated to art um and what i do is messy so it has to be it can't be carpeted um but yeah i that's uh my focus really is on uh becoming a full-time artist and fortunately over the years uh with computer technology i've been able to you know when i can't get out to galleries or get into brick and mortar exhibits i've been able to exhibit my art in the virtual realm, 3D uh, virtual reality, um, which a lot of people are not really familiar with, but a lot of people are. And because of virtual galleries, I've been able to gain an audience uh, that's global. There are, you know, people in Japan and other countries who are familiar with my name and my work now. Um, And I, I didn't really expect that of you know to really happen when I got into it 10 years ago but it's been a marvelous experience I've met and uh, communicated with and interacted with a lot of different artists from around the planet because of that and um, but I'd like now to start exhibiting locally Um, I wanted to do that in Atlanta I was actually living in Atlanta when I when I started painting full time and um, eventually had to move back north. And then I found that the Atlanta arts community sort of exploded after I left. (laughs) So I don't know. I may wind up going back to Atlanta at some point. Um, But I'm looking for opportunity here in the New New Jersey, Philadelphia area. So, Dean, you got any opportunities for? You're up there in New Jersey. (laughs) That's something I will have to research, man, and get back with you on that. So. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a We'll have to see what we can find. Now, what has it been? I got one oh, other yeah. guest I want to bring in as well. But uh, what has it been like in terms of trying to get into the gallery spaces? Because I know we've had other artists on. That's been one of their things is that if you're not a quote-unquote established artist or have like this certain kind of track record, not all galleries are as easy to get into. So I was just wondering what your experience has been like trying to get into galleries. And are you trying mainstream galleries or are you trying a mixture of both mainstream and what we would consider community galleries? Well, to be honest, um, the only time I ever approached a brick and mortar gallery was about maybe six, seven years ago in uh, the Atlanta area. And it, I was not successful. I didn't know uh, too many people, you know, who were connected. And um, so there wasn't really anyone to introduce me. Um, And fortunately today, because of our technology, galleries are not um, the only way to go. We're able to, you know, create our own exhibits, our our own own spaces. Um, And as I said now, also in the virtual world, we can create our own galleries, which I've I've done successfully. a gallery representation would be great, though. So, you know, that's not off the table at all. Um, so I do plan on um, sort of delving into that again in the future. And uh, Kelly and I, if y'all are still on the call, then we'll bring in our next guest as well. 
But that actually brings up an interesting point, which is that, yes, for visual artists, it's probably easier to do some of these things on a more virtual kind of reality. I don't know how easy that is for dance and tours of, like, spoken word and for um, drumming. Because, But is, is it possible to get some virtual connections to the art world through those mediums as well? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> There's a lot of spoken word being done virtually. Um, it, it's really a wonderful uh, environment and medium, the virtual world, the virtual realm. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, there are a lot of spoken word uh, events that are going on in, in the uh, areas, you know, that I operate in. A lot of that. Gotcha. Drumming as well, because musicians okay. also use the virtual world by streaming from their studios. Yeah. Kelly, are you still with me? I'm still here. So, um, how much have you done? Hmm. How much have you done that way? Um, I've done quite a, I've done a little bit. Um, I have, uh, I have a few different courses that I do. <clears throat> and these are, these are actually courses that I do in the community, um, uh, for, for my adult class in terms of West African drumming. And, um, what I do to supplement the courses is I actually, uh, especially if someone misses a class or two, I have these private groups, uh, that you can create on Facebook or even on YouTube that are private just for the folks who have re- registered for the class. And, uh, and I record, I record myself giving, uh, sample lessons of everything we've done in class, maybe all the accompaniments we studied in class, and so that people can go and um, and they can actually look back. Let's say they've gone the whole week and class is coming up and you're driving to class and say, oh, man, I haven't even practiced any of the stuff we did last week. You can actually go on to the private group and watch the video clips of the accompaniment and refresh yourself before class. I mean, add some extras for people to practice, and then when they come to class, they say, well, who tried the new challenge that I gave you? Um, I've also made stuff, made uh, these private groups available to specific schools that I work with, specific school groups that I work with on a um, on a more intense basis. Um, I've recently, well, over the last year, I've been asked to do court, to do classes over Zoom or Skype, and um, in terms of percussion, the latency issues with that technology makes things a little bit challenging. But um, but uh, I'm definitely still working on that. Sounds wonderful. Um, de- definitely stay on the line there and everything. Uh, Dean, did I hear either Betsy or Sonia come on the line as well? Yeah, we have Betsy Arts Access waiting to get in. Actually. Welcome to Straight Talk with Dana Mark. You are now on the line. Hey there. This is Betsy from Arts Access. How are you doing, Betsy? Betsy, you may even know some of these people that I'm talking to. I don't know that you know Judy Leon, but I'm thinking you probably know Telly and um, Aya because part of what you do is you try to make sure that the arts is available to those folks that are having various disabilities. I'm imagining that it's both physical and mental disabilities, but tell folks a little bit about what Art Access is all about here in North Carolina. Sure, and I'm I'm actually really enjoying your conversation. I'm learning a lot, so thank you for just being out there and talking about the arts because they're important. Um, and I'll start with that. I think sort of what Arts Access believes that the arts are powerful and the arts are important for lots of reasons, and we don't want people to be denied access because of a disability. And we um, work on accessibility for all disabilities, low vision, people who are blind, people who are deaf, physical disabilities, somebody that might use a wheelchair or a walker, and then things like autism and mental illness. So we're really not limited by a disability. And the way we do that, we don't provide the arts. We don't want to have a theater or a gallery. Our job is to get out there and talk to people that are making art and hosting art and putting on plays and productions and say, you know, you need to think about everybody. You need to think about putting the welcoming mat for all people and how do you do that and why it's important. And um, that's where our work lives is really supporting the the people making the art 
to include it, but our other audience is with people with disabilities. A lot of people with disabilities, they stay home because it's too much hassle or they don't feel welcome or they don't know that there's people out there willing to include them. Um, so we're sort of a champion for the arts for people that might think um, that people aren't wanting them there. Um, and so that's very powerful. I spend a lot of time at resource fairs and in special ed classrooms talking to families, just saying, you know, your kid can do a lot, and, and here's the places that will give them a drumming class or, you know, isn't a wheelchair-accessible space or it's not going to look at them funny because he's acting different. So it's, it's training and support for the people that make the arts, but we also are just sort of a champion um, and a cheerleader uh, for a, a very marginalized community that often doesn't feel welcome or thought about and trying to get them out and participating. And, and I was wondering about that, both as participants as well as audience members. How do you think we're doing in terms of actually encouraging people from the various communities within the uh, various various forms it's, of disability to actually it's, get it's to much, these kind of events? It's much better. <laughs> it's much, much, much better. I mean, I think if you look at the numbers, I mean, one in five North Carolinians lives with a disability. And I'm I'm a boomer. I'm a baby boomer. I mean, we're aging. The the people that have, you know, the the swell in population is is acquiring disabilities as we age. I've got a bad knee. You know, I really care about stairs and how far I have to walk now. Um, and you lose your vision and you lose your sight. So I think the market's driving it a little bit. I think if somewhere like DPAC or um, Carolina Theater doesn't think about things like, you know, wheelchair accessibility and parking and all that, they're going to lose audiences. So that's better. And then, of course, in 1990, we passed a hugely important piece of civil rights legislation for people with disabilities, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, it's 35 years old, um, but it really has, there's a little bit of legal teeth behind people thinking and doing this. So if I call somewhere and say, can you provide sign language um, for your poetry reading, and, you know, it's Duke University, and they say no, <laughs> you can say, well, wait a minute, I, I do have, under the law, I can ask for that. You know, that's a, that's a reasonable accommodation. That's what the law says. So a short answer, yes, it's much better. Do we have a long way to go, and do I hear from people weekly that they couldn't get in somewhere? Yes. But I, I think especially artists genuinely want to, you know, include all people. Sometimes it's just just for thinking about it. You know, are you going to have your event in an upstairs space? Um, well, that's okay because sometimes that space is cheaper, but, you know, you're not going to have people with disability in a wheelchair be able to get there, that type thing. And uh, both uh, to Judy and uh, Kelly and I, uh, how do you think that you've done in that regard in terms of uh, actually reaching out to folks with disabilities? I know I've seen some performances that all of, well, I don't know about Judy, but the rest of you have done that mm -hmm. definitely have featured folks with uh, disabilities. Well, um, so, um, okay. Judy. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting that, you know, you're, you're, uh, this is what you're doing because I was just thinking about today. Um, I was contacted by a young lady uh, through the web a little while ago um, who worked with people with disability, who worked with people um, who, who dealt with blindness, and she had heard about or seen my art, and she realized it's really textural, and that's what, what mm -hmm. uh, attracted her to it. And she said, you know, this is the type of artwork that, some of, that my clients would be able to enjoy because they could actually feel it. And I've had people... Yep. Um, look at my art and say, oh, my goodness, I just want to touch it, you know. And to be honest, I like touching my art, <laughs> artwork, too. Um, but I thought about, you know, how can I, you know, make my art something that anyone can enjoy, you know, regardless of their disability. I like I like what you're and, doing. And and thank you for – and Judy, you're up in Philadelphia, is that right? Or Philly, I'm, where are uh, you? In, South, in South Jersey, not, not too far from Philly, oh, just across the bridge. Okay, sorry. Yeah, there's um, we should talk offline. There's some amazing stuff going on in your area. There's a lot of museums that are really thinking about this. But um, mm -hmm. let me just, if y'all don't mind my advocacy, so there's something called audio description, which is a service that we do um, where you verbally describe what a, what a blind person's mm -hmm. missing. Um, and a lot of folks that can't see, 
they used to be able to see. So people don't think, oh, an art museum or a gallery show might not be interesting, but a 